reading today from 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. When David had finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan committed himself to David and loved him as much as he loved himself. Saul kept David with him from that day on and did not let him return to his father's house. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as much as himself. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lucius, for leading us in worship. It's good to be here. Good to see you folks. Um, I'm not the pa- If you just walked in, I'm not the pastor, so uh, you can thank the Lord for that. Um, but I am preaching for him today, and I'm glad to be here. We are one of your supporting churches. And so I bring you greetings from um, 93 degrees today, Birmingham, Alabama. So I'm glad to be in Vermont. Uh, <laughs> We almost froze to death last night, but it's good to be here with you. So, uh, I hope you've got a copy of God's Word. I'm going to take you to 1 Samuel chapter 18. So if you've got a copy of God's Word, do that. If you've got an iPhone or a smartphone and you've got it, let's see that holy glow. And uh, be, be sure you're in the Scripture and not checking the ball scores, okay? Um, In 1998, there were two men who bought a small restaurant chain, just kind of dotted in various places across portions of the country. Uh, They bought it with the desire and uh, the intention of taking that little dining restaurant chain and going back in their childhood, they wanted to create a neighborhood place. They said, we remember growing up in small neighborhoods, we remember Everybody was family, everybody just kind of, you know, how back at that time, everybody raised everybody else's kids, or they told everybody's kids what to do, and you had to do it, or they'd go tell your parents. And so they had that neighborhood feel, that family feel, that uh, sense. They said, we wanted to feel like how we felt when we went to church, we waved at each other across the auditorium, went out to the diner after church, spoke to everybody. And so that little chain, they renamed it, and it became Applebee's, your neighborhood grill. It became the largest dining restaurant in America over a number of years because they wanted to recreate that sense of this is where friendship is built. Now, two years later, Starbucks, I know you know what that is, Starbucks caught that idea from these two guys at Applebee's and they said, we're going to do this. We want this place to be a place of connection. So they stunned the business world and they started wiring all their little stores for a thing that people were just beginning to hear about called Wi-Fi. So everybody could come to Starbucks and get connected. There is this desire, even in the secular world, the restaurant world, and the coffee world, to be connected. Never have we been more connected, and yet, at the same time, we're lonelier than we've ever been before. Now, if you doubt that, let me tell you, about three or four weeks ago, the British government, in Great Britain, they added a new ministry. It'd be like the President of the United States adding a new cabinet member. They added a new ministry, and it was the ministry of loneliness because they say loneliness throughout the British Empire is perhaps the greatest struggle that they have right now. Now, here's the funny thing about it. There's only one of them in the office, um, so he may get lonely. Now, I want, you to, I want you to listen because we all hunger for friendship. We all long for friendship. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of statistics here. And I'm leading into the text, so just stick with me and think about this. National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago revealed that Americans have fewer and fewer close friends and that we are suffering physiologically because of it. In a three-year study by sociologists at the State University of New York looking for qualities that make for good mental health, they discovered that those who have close personal friendships 
are less often depressed and less anxious than those who don't. Dr. Robert Taylor, head of California's educational program, found that there was a connection between warm, close personal friendship and a lower mortality rate. The University of Ohio discovered in those that had no close friendships, those who suffer from loneliness and depression have a depressed immunological profile. In other words, they're not able to throw off common little illnesses like the flu or colds or things like that. With that in mind, loneliness has been called the disease of this decade. Harvard psychologist William Appleton says this, loneliness is the biggest problem in America today. Millions of people say and feel that they are lonely, but they're not sure why, and they don't know why, what they can do to make themselves better. In all the studies that I've read, I read that the average American has 10 to maybe 30 friends and 30 passive friends or associates. But now listen to this. In 1985, the average American said, I have three intimate friends. By 2004, that had dropped to two. And today, research says that a third of Americans say they have no close friend. 1 Samuel chapter 18, you're going to see a classic friendship. And you're going to see in the Word of God what a friendship is to look like and how a friendship is made. And that's what I really want you to see out of this text this morning is how do I build that friendship and what's involved in a friendship. Now let me just do this. I, I was thinking early this morning and I wrote down a couple of notes. What, what do we mean about classical friendship? So I'm going to give you what uh, some scholars have said. A commitment to virtue and mutual improvement. That is, that is the term of classic friendship that's been lost in our day. We have ceased uh, to be, believe that friends, that a friend's biggest purpose is to summon us to the good by offering moral advice and correction. Now, did you get that? That classic friendship is this I build a relationship with somebody who is going to do this for my life. They are going to be good for me by giving me moral advice and correction. Now, we've abandoned that. We, no, that's not my friend. What we have is what is called today therapeutic friendship. Now, just listen to this. Non-judgmental, uh, unconditional acceptance of whatever you do, not, not unconditional love, did you hear this? But just unconditional acceptance of whatever you want to do. Now, I want to tell you something. If you've got somebody who just unconditionally accepts everything you do, they don't love you. That's not love. We think friends fulfill their duty by taking our side, validating our feelings, supporting our decisions, and helping us feel good about ourselves. You know what that reveals? We are very fragile people. We're very fragile. We just need somebody to just say, hey, whatever you do is okay. Whatever you do is okay. Let me tell you something. Even as a parent, a parent, as a husband, as a friend, that is never, ever healthy. So I want to take you now to Scripture, and I want you to look at a, at a classic friendship. It is one of the things in the Old Testament that most people know about, the friendship between Jonathan and David. And I want to show you something in this, and this is where I'm going to end up. I want, you to, I want you to understand that the right kind of friendship can endure for eternity. Now let me take you to the first thing I want you to see, and I'm going to begin in verse 1 of chapter 18. Friendships begin uh, with a commonality. There's something common. Now I'm going to give it to you up front between Jonathan and David, the commonality, it was built on their faith in God. Now that was the commonality. Now let me back up and show you this relationship. If you've got your Bibles open to uh, 1 Samuel 18, look back at the end of, of chapter 17. David had just killed Goliath and he cut his head off. And uh, Abner, who is the general for uh, Saul, brings David now. David, to me, I don't think David could be 
more than about 15 years of age at this time. He brings David now to Saul. And David walks up. If you look at the text, it says that David walks up there and he's carrying the head in his hand. So if you can imagine, here's this boy carrying the head of a giant that he's just defeated and cut his head off. And he's standing there talking to Saul. And Jonathan is standing there next to his father, next to Saul. Verse 1, chapter 18, it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Now I'm going to stop right there because this friendship begins with this whole thing of commonality. Here's Jonathan, and he looks at David, and he says, that's going to be my best friend right there. And in the process somewhere, David is going to say to himself as well, this is going to be my best friend. And what it was is that they saw something in each other uh, that was common ground. Now, listen, you know of David's defeat of Goliath. I've just talked about that. Everybody knows David slew Goliath. But I'm sure your pastor went over, or you've at least looked at the 14th chapter of 1 Samuel, where Jonathan goes up against the Philistines by himself. He climbs up this crag, this mountain, this, uh, this uh, steep mountain he climbs up, and there are about 20 Philistines that are there. And Jonathan says to his armor bearer in verse 6, chapter 14, he said to his young man who was carrying his armor, come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. Now, this is the commonality I want you to get right here. Both these young men trusted God. Jonathan saw that in David. David saw that in Jonathan. They both trusted God. Number two, they both believed God would intervene on their behalf. That's exactly what Jonathan just said right there. It doesn't take an army to do the work of God. It doesn't take a mega church to reach a community, by the way. I could just start slinging out all kind of application, but I'll, I'll try to keep this under an hour today. Um, he, he, they both believed God would intervene. David believed God would intervene and help him defeat the giant. And they both were willing to risk for the cause of God. And so here is David, and he looks at Jonathan, and he sees that. And here is Jonathan, and he looks at David, and he sees that. And there is this commonality, and they come together in this, in this classic friendship that has now lasted some 3,000 years. People talk about the relationship of David and Jonathan and Jonathan and David. Now, let me, let me show you how a friendship begins. It begins with somebody taking an initiative. Do you see that in verse 1? The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Before, before they were ever in a place of just conversation, Jonathan in his heart said, I am going to be this guy's best friend. He took an initiative. And you say, wait a minute, preacher, that's always risky. It is always risky to, to, to decide I'm going to take the initiative in a relationship. Now, listen. I know, I've known Baptist churches, I've been preaching for over 40 years, and in churches everywhere I have ever pastored, and churches wherever I've preached, there always, there's always somebody going to come up and say, well, you know, this, nobody's ever been my friend, nobody's ever tried in this church, nobody's ever done. Let me, let me tell you something, I find people who are waiting for everybody else to take the initiative but them. Now look, I'm from the South, I'm going to start rolling my own amens up here. Amen! <laughs> We're always waiting for somebody else to come and take the initiative. Jonathan didn't do that. He took a risk. He took the initiative, and he said, I'm going to be this guy's best friend. I'm going to build a relationship with him. In any kind of relationship, there is always somebody who takes the initiative first. So there is how it begins. You, have, you know what Scripture says? Scripture says this, a friend, if you want to have a friend, You've got to show yourself to be friendly. So you've got to walk across this worship center and speak to somebody. Stick out a hand and say, hey, who are you? Let me get to know you. 
The second thing is this. How does that uh, friendship thrive? I want it to grow. Now, I'm going to give you eight quick things. So if you've got something you want to write with, you can write these down. But I'm going I'm to do this quickly because this is, I think, this personally will help you in building relationships with people. Number one, we need friends for emotional support. Proverbs 27, 9 says this, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, so a man's counsel is sweet to his friends. Now, I've got I've to add something. Right before that verse, in verse 6, you're going to read these words. Um, faithful are the wounds of a friend. A friend will not always agree with you. But in their disagreement with you, they will be found faithful. I've had a lot of times, I've had men in the church, I've had my elders, or I've had deacons, or I've had a man in the church, or I've had my wife come and say, now listen, you, you really need to think about this, you need to rethink that. And it's kind of like, well, are you not going to support me? And they've just simply said, no, you need to think about this. You need to go back and reconsider and pray about this. Now, let me tell you something. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. It might hurt to hear the truth, but it might be the best thing for you. Amen. 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 Good. <laughs> Number two, we need friends when we find ourselves in trouble. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. Even when you are wrong, he, he's going to point out you're wrong, but he's still going to love you. Number three, friendship gives stability. Through these chapters, if I, if I, honestly, if I had about an hour, I'd take you through and show you David is a, in a constant state of being attacked and in crisis and in running. And through all of that, the stability for David comes in the friendship of Jonathan. Jonathan is always there. Number four, we need friends for spiritual counsel. Now, I'm going to give you an insight into Jonathan and David. David does well when he's with Jonathan. It's when he gets away from Jonathan that things begin to kind of get fuzzy for David. Listen to this. Spiritual counsel. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We need friends, number five, for freedom of expression. Jonathan could be Jonathan around David. David could be David around Jonathan. Have you got somebody that you can just kind of go and just let your hair down? Now, Pastor, you have to have this in your life. You have to have somebody that you can just go and just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scream, throw a fit, fall on the floor, kick my feet, and you're going to understand. I've just got to have somebody I can be myself around. You have to. Everybody has to do that. You can't always you know, be on, you just got to have somebody, folks, that you can be yourself around. <laughs> Number six, we need friends for protection against loneliness. That's what I've been talking about, is this whole thing. Jonathan provided that for David. By the way, you know what you're going to discover in this? Jonathan, this, this whole relationship almost looks a little one-sided. Jonathan is always pouring into David, by the way. Number seven, you need friends for love and acceptance. You need somebody to love and accept you the way you are. And number eight, we need friends because we need to give ourselves to someone else. We need to be pouring into somebody else and not just somebody constantly pouring into us. Uh, you do that and you're going to discover um, you don't have a friendship. You've got a You've got a problem is what you've got. If you're never pouring in and you need somebody to pour into you. So there you go. I've given you eight things that are very important in the whole thing of making a friendship thrive. That's how it starts. It starts with commonality. Let me give you the second thing. The second thing is this, is friendship is going to grow. Now, I've built the friendship. How is it going to grow? And you're going to see this in David and Jonathan. Friendship grows with expressions of loyalty and a demonstration of concern. Now, let me take you back to the text. I've made it through verse 1. So let's, uh, let's pick it up in verse 2. So Saul took him that day, and he didn't let him return to his father's house. Now, here's Saul. Now, this is what Saul's going to do. Saul does what the world does. I'm going to use this boy for my good, for my benefit. I'm just going to use him. I'm not going to befriend him, but I'm going to use him. 
He's going to think I'm his friend, but the only reason I'm doing that is because I'm using him for my good. That's not so with Jonathan. Verse 3, then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Now I want to just, I'm going to say this in passing because so many times people have taken this and said there was something sexual in this. Absolutely not. There was a covenant. This was a covenant made before God between these two friends. And it was a deep friendship that enabled David to eventually rise to the place where he could become the king of Israel. God had put Jonathan in David's life, and I believe he had put David in Jonathan's life because Jonathan lived a hard life. We don't ever talk about that. But they made a covenant. You know what? This is not the last of that. That's the first time. Look with me on over to chapter 20 and verse 16. And you read there, here's the second time they do this. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David. And then they do it one more time. It was not just David. Jonathan made the covenant with his whole house. Whoever his family would be. You come to chapter 23, and in chapter 23, verse 18, you read this. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. So here are these two friends, and they have such a friendship that they build it on a covenant that is based on God. Now listen, that's no small thing for Jonathan. Do you know why? Because Jonathan is making a covenant with David, and it is David who is going to come to the throne. Jonathan is essentially saying, I know that you're going to rule. He's going to say this. I'm going to take you to it in just a few minutes. He says, you're going to rule Israel. You're going to be king. When that was Jonathan's place in the lineage of Saul, he was to inherit the throne. He was willing to sacrifice being king of Israel because he knew the will of God for David's life. And he says, I'm going to be a friend who's going to help you get the will of God for your life. Son, have mercy. Now that's a friend, right? I'm willing to give up. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to do this for you because this is God's will for your life. Have you ever expressed that kind of loyalty to somebody else? Has anyone in your life ever expressed that kind of friendship to you? That's the kind of friendship that never, ever goes away. It's an expression of loyalty. I am loyal to you. Yesterday, I think it was Cliff that asked me, he, we were sitting at lunch and he, he, asked, he asked me the question, he says, what would you do in your ministry if you could go back and redo some things? And I said, well, number one, I talked to him about preaching and then the second thing I said to him was this. I said, I think I would do this. I think I would go back in all my ministry and I would strengthen, I would invest more, strengthen and maintain my friendships, my relationships. Can you look back over your life and just say, you know, there was somebody that was a friend back there, but it just kind of faded away. Nothing bad happened. It just kind of faded away. It just kind of went away. I got a call this morning early from my sister. My first cousin uh, died uh, uh, last night, I think it was, of cancer. She had pulled completely away from her family. And in the days prior to her death, Um, her sister went to her and said, you're dying, I want to be here for you. And she looked there and said, I want nothing to do with you. How sad to die like that without anybody, without anybody. Can you remember? Maybe it wasn't anything like that, but there's just a faded memory of a friendship that you stopped investing in. Let me tell you what causes friendships to grow is your investment. It is expressions of loyalty, and look at this now, secondly, demonstration of concern. Take your Bibles and go to chapter 19. There's just uh, an incident right here where Saul comes out now and he tells Jonathan and he tells all the soldiers in Israel, all right, the gloves are off. I want David dead. No more of this kind of just moving behind the scenes. I'm going to tell you up front, I want him dead. Saul told Jonathan, his son, and all the servants to put David to death. 
But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So Jonathan told David, now watch this, here comes an information and then there's going to be an intercession. Jonathan went to David saying, Saul my father is seeking to put you to death. Now therefore, please be put on guard in the morning and stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father. Did you see that? There was the information. David, you need to understand this. This is what's about to take place. And the intercession. I'm going to go, and I'm going to stand next to my father, and I'm going to speak. Now listen, let me tell you something. Do y'all not see something in this? What does that sound like? Do you know right now that the, that the king of kings stands at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and he makes intercession for you. He's praying for you. You say, not for me. Yes, he is. Whoever you are, he's praying for you. He makes intercession for you. And listen, here's one better. His spirit, the spirit of God is in you, praying for you when you don't know how to pray for yourself. Now, that's a good word. I can show you something else here. I'm just going to take the time to do it. On the plane, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about moving this in this direction. Here's the king, the real king, David, who is hidden. You cannot see him. Saul represents the kings of this world. He represents the world system. And here is Jonathan who goes and stands beside the world system, and he says, I will take my stand and I will speak. Who does Jonathan represent? You and me in Burlington, Vermont. I will stand in the midst of the world system and I will bear witness to the real king and not the government. Huh? Well, anyway, I wouldn't, I'm not going to preach that. So that doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing right now. Here's what he does. He goes out there and now he's going to plead with his father. And he shares with his father now about David. And he reminds his father all that David had done. Look, look, in fact, look at this. He says, don't let the king, verse 4, sin against his servant David, since he's not sinned against you. He's done nothing to you. David has done nothing for Saul, but, but what was good. In fact, he says it, since his deeds have been very beneficial to you. He's been a blessing to you. If you want to know what you can go tell your lost neighbor about Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ has been a blessing to you and you've never even realized it. He's caused the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He's called the sun to shine on the just and the unjust alike. Amen? Well, there he is. That's what he's doing. He's right there. He's demonstrating his concern for David. He's pouring himself out for David. I don't know if you've ever heard the name Dawson Trotman. Y'all know the Navigators? Dawson Trotman founded the Navigators. Great man of God, used in an incredible way. There was a young guy by the name of Lawrence Sants. Now, you've never heard of him. Nobody's really ever heard of him. But Lawrence Sants was a young man who felt like nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody's interested in me. Um, nobody's going to be my friend. Nobody's going to pour themselves into my life. And Dawson Trotman found Lawrence Sants, and this is what he did. He says, I want you to meet me every morning, every morning at 5 o'clock in my office. For 15 years, Dawson Trotman poured himself into this young man who had such a, 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 a self-image that was so worthless, it took Trotman 15 years to do it. He taught him how to pray. He taught him how to read the Word of God. He taught him how to do a devotional life. He taught him discipleship. He discipled him. Lawrence Sands finally got a hold of it and understood what he was supposed to do, went out and started a Bible study. There was a guy by the name of Charlie Riggs, grew up in Pennsylvania as a teenager, worked in the coal mine, was drafted into the Navy, got over here in this Bible study with Lawrence Sands, and came to Christ, was discipled because uh, Lawrence Sands poured his life into Charlie Riggs. And you say, well, who is Charlie Riggs? Charlie Riggs is the guy who went around the world multiple times training hundreds of thousands of people 
how to counsel people who walk down the aisle at a Billy Graham crusade. He's the guy who did that. Why? Because a guy who felt like he had no friend was befriended by Dawson Trotman who poured himself into him. Now listen, let me, let me just ask you something. Do you pour yourself into the life of anybody else? You know what Jonathan could have done? Jonathan could have just come and said, hey, David, you think you've got it bad? I got to live with him. He's my daddy and he's tried to kill me. He's tried to kill you, but he's my daddy and he's tried to kill me. I have to live with him. My life is tough. My life is hard. My life is difficult. You don't ever come to me, David. It's always me coming to you. He did not do that. You never find that in Scripture. He doesn't go and pour criticism or bitterness or anger into David. He is always there pouring something that is positive into the life of David. Now, I ask you that for this reason. What are you pouring into the life of your wife? What are you pouring into the life of your husband? What are you pouring into the life of your friends? You see, your friendship is going to grow when you'll express loyalty and you'll demonstrate real concern. Here's the last thing. The last thing is this. Friendship knows how to encourage. Now this is the best part of all to me. Go to chapter 23. From chapter 19 and 20, David's running. He's running, running, running. Running across the pages of chapter 19, running across the pages of chapter 20, running across the pages of chapter 21, running across the pages of chapter 22, running into chapter 23. He's out in the wilderness. I've been to Israel three times in the last uh, calendar year, in the last uh, 12 months. I've spent, um, I've spent time over the last year out in the wilderness uh, of Israel. It's barren, it's dry, it's hot, it's miserable, it's sand. There's rarely anything green out there. And David is out there running on these great massive mountains, these Judean mountains, these cliffs. He's running and hiding up in these caves around these cliffs. Jonathan finds him. Watch this. This is the amazing thing to me. Verse 15, chapter 23, now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish. Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horish. He went out, he took the time, the energy, the effort to go find him in the day. Now what did he go out there to do? To encourage him in what? In God. Do you know what the Hebrew word is, encourage there? It means to strengthen the hand. Strengthen the hand. Now, this is, this is a word play. In the Hebrew, that's why I tell you this, to strengthen the hand. Because now he's going to tell him this. Do not be afraid because the hand of my father Saul will not find you. He went out to strengthen his hand in God. You know what he did? He's reminding him now of God's promises to him. He's telling him about God's promises. And he says, in the present, my father's not going to find you. You don't have to worry. My dad's not going to lay a hand on you. Not because he doesn't want to, but because God's not going to let him. Here's the second thing. This is a word for the future. You will be king over Israel. Hey, David, you remember Samuel came, chapter 16. He anointed you. You're going to be king. We all know it. Dad knows it. I know it. Everybody knows this. That's the future. God's determined this. Now watch the certainty of this. And I, now here is, here's the acid test of friendship right here. I will be next to you. Now can you be friends with somebody whom God is blessing financially more than he's blessing you? Can you be friends with somebody whom God is blessing professionally more than he's blessing you? Can you be a loyal friend to that person? Can you be a loyal friend to, to a person whom it is obvious that God is pouring out his blessing on his life uh, more than God is showing blessing to you? Jonathan was. Jonathan was. wasn't He wasn't jealous. He wasn't mad. He wasn't bitter about any of it. 
He said, when you get to where God, it's obvious God's hand is on you. And when you get to the throne of Israel, where I could sit, that's supposed to be mine. He doesn't say that. He says, when you get there, he said, you know what? You're going to look up and I'm going to be standing right there beside you. Now, buddy, let me tell you something. That's a friend right there. That's a friend. He says, I will be there. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David stayed at Horish. Jonathan went to his house. Do you see that there at the end of verse 18? I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is the last time they ever meet. Jonathan dies in battle. Uh, he's killed in battle with his dad, with his brothers. He dies. He never sees David again. But their friendship isn't over. Huh? Right? Their friendship isn't over. Look back through Scripture at the great friendships that you see. There was Moses and Aaron. That was his brother. Moses and Joshua. There was Peter and John. There was Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Timothy. There was Barnabas and Mark. You want a couple? You want a husband and wife? Priscilla and Aquila? You know, one of you one day will die in relationships and the other will be left. But that relationship doesn't have to be over. A couple of years ago, Within 11 months, my dad went home to be with the Lord. Six and a half months later, my mom went home to be with the Lord. And five months after that, my, my best friend ever died of a brain tumor. I was with him less than 12 hours before he died. I walked into the room. His wife and his daughter, they'd named their daughter after my wife. And I walked into the room and he was in the bed, comatose. He thought he was in a coma. I spoke to him. He went to the University of Georgia. I said some ugly things about the University of Georgia. <laughs> Thinking, I, I, I thought, that'll get a response out of nothing. I sat down for an hour. And across the bed, I talked to his wife and I talked to his daughter. Son was on his way there from up in Virginia. He was on his way there because they didn't think he would live very long. And um, I said, I've got to get back to Jacksonville, which was about a three-hour drive. I said, I've got to get on back home. It was late in the evening. And I said, I'm going to go. And I stood up and just said to my friend, goodbye. He opened his eyes, looked at me, and said, goodbye. And then he said this, I'll see you on the other side. And I said, I'll see you on the other side. And he closed his eyes. And I said, look at me. I, my name for him was Goober. I said, Goober, look at me. And he never opened his eyes again. But friendship in Jesus Christ here means eternity friendship there now that's good some of y'all need to smile that's good huh that's good but now listen i've got a friend that's waiting there but i'm going to tell you something i got a greater friend than that because jesus told his disciples i no longer call you servants but friends is jesus christ your friend if you know him as Lord and Savior, he is the best friend you will ever have. He tells us, I will never leave you. I will never desert you. In fact, do this. Just bow your heads with me. All of our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Maybe this morning you're struggling. That's where you're struggling. Maybe you say, I was in a relationship and it broke up and it's left me hurt and bitter and I'm angry. And I don't ever want to go through that again. Listen, let me tell you something. The friend that is the best friend of all, Jesus Christ, will never hurt you. He'll bless your life beyond your beliefs. Do you know him? Have you ever put your faith and your trust in him? Have you ever come to him and said, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. 
who died on a cross for me. And I do believe that you were raised from the dead to give me eternal life. And I'm coming this morning and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. And I'm desperately in need of a friend. And I want you to be more than a friend. I want you to be my Savior. Now, if you just prayed that, let me ask you something. With every head bow and every eye closed, you just slip your hand up. You said, I just prayed that. I've asked Christ to be not just my friend, but I've asked him to be my Savior. Have you done that? Amen. Amen. There are folks here that have just done that. Now, that is tremendous victory, folks. You have just passed, listen, out of the kingdom of death into the kingdom of life. Jesus Christ now is your Savior. Now, Satan will want you to believe, no, 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 that didn't happen. But I'm here to tell you, don't listen to his voice. You listen to the revealed word of God that says this, to as many as believed on him, to them gave he the power to become the sons and the daughters of God. Father, thank you for what you've done here this morning, for speaking, using your word, speaking to our heart. Thank you, Lord, for these that have indicated that they've just trusted, given their heart and their life to you. I pray, Lord, that you'd give them the courage to come and make that public, to come and share with the pastor the decision that they've made. I pray for them personally, that you give them strength, that you watch over them, God, that you bless their lives and that they would know they have a friend now who sticks closer than a brother. For we pray it in Jesus' name.